Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Christine Tobacco. I'm a partner at Fenwick & West, which is a large technology firm. We work with companies across the spectrum from two founders getting started through to large uh, public technology companies. Um, we have a great panel this morning. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll be off to the races. I'm uh, Jeff Richards. I'm a partner at GGV Capital. We're a venture capital firm based in Menlo Park and uh, Shanghai. So half the firm is in China, half is in the US and we manage about $4 billion. Our current fund is $1.2 billion. Very similar to Lightspeed. Um, I, uh, I'm Nicole Quinn, um, partner at uh, Lightspeed uh, Venture Partners. Um, also have a $1.2 billion fund and about uh, $4 billion assets under management. Um, we are based in uh, San Francisco, but we really do think that there are great companies being started all across the country and the world. So we actually have more portfolio companies in LA, more portfolio companies in New York um, on the consumer side than we do in San Francisco. Um, so out here it's The Honest Company, Holla, Snapchat, um, Whisper. So we really do believe that uh, there's great companies being started everywhere. Uh, Duncan Davidson, Bullpen Capital. I used to be in a billion dollar fund, but <laughs> we're, we have about 150 million under management right now. We do post C, which is the end of the seed process before you go to the A round. So we're going to talk a bit about how the valuations are. I will say, cheap plug, I love Fenwick. We use them all the time. Thank you. Yes. And I was on a panel with week. Hans from GGV last week in New York. Great guy. All right. We're going to have uh, questions at the end, but we'll um, talk amongst <coughs> ourselves for a little while. Um, Jeff, how do you think companies should think about valuations as they're heading into fundraising? Um, well, I think it's, it's a pretty bifurcated market. We talked about this on our prep call. Um, there's a ton of money at the seed uh, stage right now. I mean, a, a, you know, by some accounts, 5x the amount of money that was there five or six years ago. So literally, I have a founder that we backed before, Omar Tawakal, who founded Blue Kai, sold that to Oracle for $420 million, went out to raise a $2 million seed round in the fall and ended up with $5.5 million. And so, you know, and he's a terrific founder, and, and we backed him again. Um, but I think it's just interesting that he, it, it just amazed him how much interest there was and how much demand there was. You know, and then I think as you go further up the food chain, it gets a little more difficult. Um, series A's, there was definitely a, a period in the fall, right around the election, where, where Series A's were maybe a little more difficult to get done. And then, you know, right now, we're seeing a lot of Series B and C deals get done that, are, that have a lot of momentum at, at, at pretty high prices. But there's a massive hangover of companies that raised money in 2014 and 2015 uh, that are now trying to come back out to the market, and it's a pretty challenging environment for a lot of those companies. A lot of them didn't hit their growth plans. A lot of them are, are in categories that haven't played out that well, food, on-demand services, things like that. And so there is a there there is a bit of a challenge, you know, both for, for companies that we have in our portfolio as well as other folks that, you know, these companies that were raised a lot of money in 2014 and 2015 that are coming back to the market. So I, think, I just think there's a, a big difference, right? You've got early stage, a lot of froth, a lot of frenzy, mid to late, it's, it's, you know, the haves and the have-nots. Okay. And what about the metrics people are using to think about valuation? How are you seeing that differ um, at the seed stage versus, you know, A or, or later stages? <laughs> okay. That hasn't changed. No, I think, I think at, the, at the early stages, it's all about the founding team and the market they're going after and, you know, just kind of trying to come up with a reasonable amount of money and a reasonable amount of ownership. You know, at the, at the middle stages, those are, those are why those, those rounds can often be harder to raise because if you're diving into a Series B, particularly for an enterprise software company, for example, and you're looking at real metrics. And I think that's a hard, sometimes that's a hard process for founders to go through because the seed and the A were all about hope and dreams and then they're coming out for the B or the C and people are asking them real questions about metrics and growth and, you know, qu quotas and comp plans and things like that. So it's, it's challenging. Um, there's no hard and fast metrics. I was just involved in two deals that got done at around $200 million valuation. Both of those are companies with single digit, you know, recurring enterprise revenue, but for terrific repeat founders. If they weren't terrific repeat founders, they'd probably get done at, you know, half that price. Okay. So it, it, there's no hard and fast rules. And really, at the end of the day, we're making a bet on founding teams to try and create, you know, really big outcomes. And there's not that many of those. Duncan, what about you? What are you seeing in terms of met relevant metrics? Well, first of all, we saw. Bullpen has formed to take advantage of a change in the ecosystem. There's actually two changes. The one most people recognize is it's cheap to start a company. This is the era cheap. I did two startups in the 90s. One took five million, one took 10 million to get going. You had to raise that much money. You had to go to a big fund to get it. Today, you get started on almost nothing, maybe 500,000 or even lower to get going. That change everybody recognized. Bullpen has formed to be at the end of the seed process. So we sort of get eventually to accumulate maybe $5 million in the company before it goes to the bigger funds. 
The second change is less well recognized. A lot of Series A people still invest on thesis, and they're still investing like they might have in the 90s. But when you're in market, you're mobile or you're on the internet, you have metrics. They may be user metrics, they may be revenue metrics, you have metrics. So when they come into the late stage process, it's no longer, oh, do I like this thesis or not? It's, oh, what are the numbers? So let me give you an example. So we are very much on the cusp between the end of the seed and going to a big, big fund. So take SaaS. Now, how many people here are doing SaaS? Anybody? You investing? There's no SaaS in this group? That's, oh, that's too bad. I was going to say, I guess anything I want, nobody could challenge me. Damn it. <laughs> I got to be right. So SaaS, about five or six years ago, enterprise software companies were selling in the public markets for maybe 4x forward 12 months. SaaS was coming in more like 5x, a little bit higher quality revenue. It's usually pre-sold as bookings that you're going to work off over the next year. In 2014, that metric went haywire. Public markets began paying 8 or 9x for forward 12 months ARR in a SaaS business. ARR, the real metric. And then it collapsed to 3x and it came back to 5x and now it's trending down to 4x despite the Trump rally. Quite amazing. Okay, what does it mean? In the private markets, the private people, the A rounds, a 10 on 40, a 15 on 50 or some number like that, which they were calling Series A, were being bought at when they had the right metric and multiple. If the public was 5x, they were doing 10x. So just do some math. Let's say you're doing 4 million ARR. You're out of 40 pre on a 10x multiple, the public markets are 5x. We saw those all day long. We saw companies that had come to us and in a quarter get a million dollars of ARR bookings. Okay, you're on a 4 million run rate. Maybe two quarters in a row, bam. A very quality SaaS investor comes in and gives 10 on 40 for the next round. When it got up to the crazy numbers, like 8 or 9x, we saw people paying 15 to 20x ARR. So suddenly to get 10 on 40, you could be down at 2 million ARR. If you translate it into monthly, which a lot of people do, we found the monthly number at 5x in the public markets was 250k ARR. In the period of craziness, it got down to 125 to 150 monthly re recurring revenue. People would jump in with a big A round. Now what happened? A lot of those people raised 10 on 40 or 8 on 30, and they're at the over 30 million post money right now, and they're coming out to market. And you're, you're seeing the, the problem. To go, again, I'll be very numeric. Most of the B round people after that big A want to see at least a 2x post of the A to the pre of the B. If you're at 35 or 40 post, you've got to get up to 70 pre. If you're at 10 on 40, 50 post, 100 pre. You're not going to make it. Most of these companies aren't growing fast enough to get there when the public markets drop to 5x or 4x and the multiples are now 8 or 10x. So that's just an example of what we see, and we try to take advantage of, it's almost like late stage investing at a very early stage. We take advantage of the metrics to really understand the valuation of the companies and set them up. Uh, I can say that our success rate going from post C to A is 65%. The industry is less than 10% right now, so we're pretty proud of that. Our average A round after us is 15 million, a range from 8 to 20 in the last five examples. That's, still pr that's pretty good, so that's what we do. I have to say, Billfan have some great companies. I'm looking at several of them at the moment. Uh, so, really good companies. Wow, I got to say great things about Lightroom. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice of you. <laughs> um, and then I cover uh, consumer, and that's a whole other story uh, unto itself. So, who here um, either looks at consumer companies or has started a consumer company? Okay, good. A few hands. Um, what are the rest doing? We didn't have a lot of enterprise. We didn't have a lot of consumer. What's everybody else doing? You here for the free food? <laughs> <laughs> Who's an evil banker? Anybody? <laughs> Back to you. Nobody will admit. <laughs> Nobody raises. It. Who's a good banker? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'd say on the consumer side, the good companies are still just as hot as they were in 2014 15. Um, so the companies that we've been seeing in the last few months are still getting 10 term sheets from all the good VCs down Sand Hill Road. And in terms of like specific metrics, specific multiples, um, depends very much on the vertical. I would uh, call out e-commerce and say that most of these companies are still trading on three to five times forward revenue multiples um, at the Series A, Series B stage. Um, and it really is all about the demand. So if you know that XYZ, other VCs are thinking about paying in the range of 150 to 200 million pre, then that is exactly where the range is sort of set. Um, 
and you know exactly the same with us you know we'll sort of think okay we want to pay about 200 million for this and then that is communicated by the earlier stage VCs um, to the other VCs for that particular round and then it again becomes the sort of range um, so on that point I would say something is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it um, and on that point it's true very much like for early stage um, and that is like to give a couple of examples, if you um, have someone like John Steinberg, the ex-president uh, of BuzzFeed, he decides, okay, I am going to launch my own content, uh, news site, cheddar, then that is not going to get a normal seed stage valuation for five million. It is all about him. And so, of course, there's going to be a hell of a lot of demand because of him. Same with Brian Lee from The Honest Company. When he decides he's going to start Holler and go into the vertical of online dollar stores, which nobody has done before, it's like, hey, he's started he's an amazing serial entrepreneur. If anyone can do it, he can do it. You're paying a huge premium for that. Um, and the same as see in Series A, Series B, and then also in acquisitions. Um, you know, I think that it's important to realize that if, when you speak to Doug Leone about why on earth Facebook decided to pay $19 billion for WhatsApp, I mean, it's clear that, you know, they were losing that demographic. And so, of course, they were willing to pay 10% of their market cap at that time for to be able to, you know, have a meaningful presence back with those, uh, those customers again. So I think that is the most important thing to realize with these valuations, that it is worth what someone's willing to pay for it. There's also, so, a, I was just going to add, there's also a tier of companies that you're not hearing a lot about. I mean, you've got Uber and Airbnb, which everybody's heard about. Obviously, Snapchat went public. But, you know, there's a tier of companies between 2 and $10 billion, which is, are private today that look like yesterday's super hot, small cap public stocks um, that have almost unlimited capital available to them, right? So you've got companies like Stripe and Wish and House and, I don't know, there's probably a bunch of other examples in, in, your, in your guys' portfolio. I mean, these guys have from sovereign wealth funds and public market investors and, I mean, there's just an enormous amount of money available to these founders. And so... We got a lot of questions about why aren't these companies going public? You know, I, I'm sure similar to Lightspeed, we have 18 companies in our portfolio today that are valued at over a billion dollars. And we're constantly getting questions about why aren't they going public? And my answer is because they can literally create a PowerPoint deck and raise $500 million in a week with, you know, without any real process. And they don't have to deal with the public market. So I think you're, you're going to see these companies continue to raise a decent amount of capital because there is so much money available from around the world. Um, at, for the foreseeable future and then eventually go public. I give Snap a lot of credit for going out and, and, and getting public, and I think we'll see some more of these, of these companies go out in the back half of this year and next year, but there's, there are some fantastic companies being built in that kind of $1 to $10 billion range that are going to be the next iconic companies as public companies that trade at 10 to 20 billion. It's just interesting that so much of the value in those companies is being accrued while they're private. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to come back to something Duncan touched on, which is, I think, and we see this when we talk to founders about fundraising strategy, you know, they, they close around, 18 months later, they're, they're back out thinking about their next round, and I think many of them feel like it has to be at, you know, a 2x, uh, the, the post on the last round, um, and I know we talked about this earlier, is that always the best strategy? I think there's some pitfalls to thinking about things that way. Well, let me make a comment. Uh, if you're a later stage investor, you're not C, you're not AB, but you're really in the later stages. If you see a company come in with less than a 2x, you'll wait. Because you'll know you can buy it in the next round, and the risk-reward is in your favor to wait. Mm -hmm. So the, the 2x is just a guideline, but you guys all see Pirates of the Caribbean, and they have talked about the pirate rules, and the pirate says, well, they're more like guidelines. The, the guideline here is that if you go to the pirates, who are us, and you don't show enough improvement, there's no reason then to invest right now, because they can buy you later. You'll, the deal will come back around to them. So that's why this 2x thing is sort of a guideline. Um, on valuation, let's just sort of step back to the very early stages. Most early stage values are just percent of the company you give up. You raise a million dollars, you give up 20%, you can do the math, it's five posts. You raise a million and a half, seven and a half posts. That's how these are done in America. In other countries, it's not like that. But here, it's that simple. A lot of the early A rounds, it's eight, nine, ten million, sort of an early A where you're still largely thesis driven, you might give up 25% of the company. And you'll see a lot of eight on 22s or nine on 24s or something because you're dealing with the percent you give up. And it's not really based upon metrics that I was describing earlier. Those deals often get into real trouble because you have to grow into the metrics. And if you don't, uh, 
Well, let me put it this way. You probably don't know, but last year, the data says that half of all C rounds are flat to down. I think this year, half of all B rounds will be flat to down. If you want a buzzword, flat is the new up. So a lot of the A rounds that come out are overvalued because they're doing, I'll give about 25% for 8 million. When they come out in the market, they're nowhere near the 60. They're going to get a flat round on the prior A, and everybody's going to be happy with that. So if you have to raise the money, you're not going to look for the 2X. And if you overprice the earlier round, you're going to take the extension. The challenge for all of you, I guess some of you are probably going to be in that category. Your challenge is to make enough progress to raise the round after that bridge or a little flat B round, or you're in real, real trouble. They won't do it twice. And so the challenge for entrepreneurs in this environment where it's getting a little bit tougher is to really get your cost in alignment, get your growth, and not just take the money and blow it as fast as you can thinking it's still there. If you're one of the wonderful unicorns over a billion that can raise 500 million on a PowerPoint, you don't know that problem. How many people here are billion dollar revenue, you know, billion dollar value companies that can raise in a week? Anybody? Decacorn's <laughs> the new unicorn though, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I personally think that we shouldn't be thinking about that 2X. Um, I do, however, think that an up round is important, um, but what that percentage is depends. Um, so I would much rather say to the Series A companies that we're speaking to, like, it's fine to take a lower valuation now that's say like 50% above your last round so that the next round that you're thinking about raising in 12, 18 months time is again another up round. Um, because it's just the sort of thing that the press jump all over if you do a down round, even if it's like a 10% down round, they just love to include you, the sort of CB insights type uh, emails. They love to talk about which companies are now in a down round and then Again, you know, that sort of goes out to everybody and it becomes sort of self-fulfilling sometimes in the VC environment. Um, and, you know, you previously were the very hot company that everybody was talking about. But then if you get classified in that down round bucket, um, then there's just a lot of talk about it. So I would encourage people to take perhaps a lower valuation right now to then make sure that they're on a steady, consistent growth rate with regards to their their sort of valuations going forward. Well, I can't, that is such great advice. Um, if you take the eight on 24, but you could have made the same progress with three on 12, if you're 15 posts and get to 30 pre in the next round, that's doable. If you're 32 posts, you can't, and you get to 30 pre in the next round, it's a down round. I, I just say, take that advice home. Raise the right amount of money, don't take the big check, and try to keep your valuation in alignment with where you're really going, and don't try to jump. Or you're gonna get into this flat as a new up situation, which is not good. Okay, let's take a few questions in our last few minutes. Anybody have a question for the panel? Oh, at the back. I think the question was, how are you seeing um, the preference stack in later rounds? It, it, it all depends on how much leverage the company and the founders have and I actually have a little bit different point of view on the down round, up round thing. I don't think it matters. I think if you're building a company, you raise, I agree with the thesis of you raise the right amount of money at the right, right time, but you know, public stocks go up and down and great company, you know, Amazon went out at a $500 million market cap, traded up to several billion, traded back down. Today it's worth mm -hmm. 300 billion. It didn't friggin' matter. And I don't think it matters for private companies either. And founders get very wrapped around the axle around up round, down round. This, the reality is you need to build a great company. If you look at Square, Right? Jack Dorsey's not disappointed with the outcome of Square. He raised a down round in his IPO. Aaron Levy at Box had a down round with, with nefarious terms at his IPO. I talked to Aaron the other day. He's down doing rounds great. IPOs are very He's different. He's doing great. I know, but I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't, we place way too much emphasis on it. And I agree with the thesis that one of the, the, the reasons they get there is they raise too much money at too high prices. But it doesn't mean that you so suddenly put your head in the sand and go away. I mean, it's like I raised money at 100 pre, now I'm raising money at 80. You know, what I should focus on is how much money am I raising and how much dilution am I taking and how does that affect the team and the rest of the company. The thing that I don't like, the, 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 um, the innocent bystanders who get crushed when instead of doing a down round, the founder says, okay, instead of raising money at 80, I'll raise money at 150, but I'll do it with a 3x liquidation preference. Well, guess who gets crushed? All the employees, right? Because they don't, they don't know about that. They don't realize how it affects the cap table. You guys mm -hmm. see this mm -hmm. in your work. And so my advice to a founder is I'd much rather have you take a deal at 80 pre 
with a straight 1x liquidation preference than deal at 150 with a bunch of funky terms that, that really hurt everybody around the table. And we, we, we just try and stay away from those kinds of deals. So I think that's, that's a byproduct of the down round culture that I, I just don't think is healthy. And a lot of people have played on that over the last 12 months. And we've seen deals get done with terms that I think will come back to, to bite the founders. And it's, it's unfortunate. I think as, a, as a founder, I founded two companies and I, I learned the hard way about those terms. And, and so yeah. that, that's what I don't like no, about that. I, I think the lesson is very important. If you have a, a preference multiple high in the stack, the common A and B are screwed. And so it's an illusion exactly. to think you're worth 150 with the 3X preference stack. The VC knows you're not. It's just a gimmick to keep a nominal high price and actually give advantage to the VC, but it crushes the stack. Your question on preference. So if you, if you get in an uncomfortable position where the only money you can raise is the down round, take it. No company went bankrupt because of dilution. Exactly. Right there. The second thing is, if you're in that situation, you can also often talk your Series A or B investors into a flat bridge or something to somewhere. But then you'd better get your economics in the company in alignment so you could, you could get to the next round as an up round and not burn that bridge or you're really in trouble. The worst thing I see, I'm seeing a lot of down rounds come in and they're out of our stage, but we still, we still look at them. The problem is they're not cleaning up the preference stack. So I've been trying to figure, I'm trying to figure out rules of thumb, guidelines all the way through here of when the metrics the next round work. The one I'm struggling with is how much preference can you carry in a recapped company mm. to the next round? What I've heard from some of the better funds we talk to is 20, 20 million of preference is about max. And that sounds high to me. I, I could ask you two, what do you think? But if you recap a company, you still have a bunch of preference on there and it's 20 million of preference and you go into the next round, uh, I've been told that's still okay. It just strikes me as high. Uh, I'd like to get rid of as much preference as I can on a recap. Just um, not on the preference point, but just on the uh, down rounds. What I'm referring to is seed to series B. Mm. I think that IPOs is a completely different ball game. Um, so I was an equity research analyst covering tech for 10 years. And I think that once you get to the point of IPO for your company, you are going after a completely different investor. So I would not even call it necessarily a down round at IPO because uh, your private investors look for very, very different things to public market investors. And profitability, for example, is something that public market investors will really start to think about. You'd, as Snapchat's case, you don't need to be profitable now, but you need to have a vision, a route to profitability. And so it is fair to take a little bit of a discount at the IPO, and I would call it a IPO discount, not necessarily a down round at that point. And so I think that that's how we should be thinking about the IPO stage. One last question. Where's somebody? Yes. Uh, we've seen a lot of pre-seed now who looks just like how seed used to look, and seed looks just like Series A used to look. Can you guys talk about really quickly uh, terms for pre-seed versus seed versus Series A in terms of valuation? Well, the, so this is very funny, but yes, uh, seed has become <laughs> A and pre-seed has become seed. And pretty soon there'll be a pre-pre-seed. I don't know. But <laughs> seed Soil. raising is a process. It, it's not, it's never been an event. It's been like a little here, a little here, a little here. You do cap convert, just go up the stack until you finally get a real round that cleans everything up. Again, even pre-seed, it's usually you give a 20% of the company for whatever the money is. And the seed round, 20%, whatever the money is. And the valuation is artificial in that sense. When you get to our stage, sort of the post-seed, uh, you're in the low teens in terms of pre-money. We're a little more metric driven because we want to make sure What we do is say this is your plan going to get you to the point Where you can get a light speed to come in in the next round or a GGV and do that 10 on 40 or something And we have to make sure your plan will get to those metrics. So to that extent we value based upon that analysis It's a little bit more Quantitative, but it's still down in this give up 20% of the company type of range a really good source that I would point you to for the exact numbers is on AngelList. You can actually go into it and you can type in all the specifics for your company, uh, from the range to what school you went to, to what city you're starting the company in. And so they'll say to you, okay, if you're raising a, a seed round, then the pre-valuation is on average four million. If you went to Stanford, then on average the pre-seed is five million. So that... <laughs> It's, honestly, you can play around with it for hours. We don't it's very entertaining. <laughs> so I'd encourage you to look at that. Yeah. Course. The only thing I would add for the seed stage, the biggest mistake we see founders make is they raise a bunch of money in convertible notes, and they don't do the math about how that's going to convert into the A. And we call our friends at Fenwick and say, could you please help these guys understand their cap table? Because they come in and they say, I want to raise a $7 million Series A, and I'm going to do it at you know 18 pre, and I'll be sitting at 25 post. And we go, 
well, what about the three million you raised on notes with an eight cap? Oh, yeah, I should probably think about that. And then all of a sudden they've got this bloated Series A. Which go into pre-money sometimes, Which goes right? into pre-money yeah. often. And so it's, I, I just, one of my biggest pieces of advice to seed founders who are thinking about an A down the road is organize your cap table, work with your general counsel to understand, your outside counsel to really understand that cap table, what you've raised, when you've raised it. So you at least, you at least go into that understanding how the math is all going to work because it's very frustrating for us when oftentimes they don't know. And, you know, we sort of are like, hey, go back and figure that all out and then come back and talk to us again. Because it's really hard for us to even figure out, you know, we don't want to fund a company where the founder gives up 50% at the Series A. It's just not, not going to be good down the road. Great. Thanks, everybody. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. The Fenwick.